I was listening to a podcast recently with the creators of Smiling Friends, which I found really interesting, where they were basically saying how inconsistent the guidelines were that they had to work with. Like, violence for the most part, they said, was completely fine unless they showed brain matter, but they absolutely were not in any capacity allowed to show smoking or vaping. They weren't allowed to imply a blowjob, and they weren't allowed to show pubic hair on one of the characters. Uh, no, no, that, you know what? You want to uh, real- Actually, Zach, you can, t- you can go into the pubic actually, hair thing. This, you know, I was joking, but there is a semi-real real. story, which was, we had a character with, you know, his pants kind of sagging and his pubes were exposed. It wasn't even that graphic. You know, it's tame for like South Park season one standards, but uh, they said S&P jumped in and said you have to remove the pubes. So some poor bastard had to go in and delete the pubes frame by frame on this fucking <laughs> this character. Yeah, that's a, tr- that's a true story, by the way. Can't see pubes. Cannot see pubes uh, on TV. But it was all good to show a demon getting ripped limb from limb and beaten to shit by a crowd of people. So even the people who make these shows don't really understand what the guidelines are. It's time to talk about four kids. A word that still keeps me up at night. Just somehow actually a step above their initial invisible guns in Yu-Gi-Oh! That just had guys aggressively pointing their fists at people. In Sonic X, among censoring things like Rouge's cleavage, a national tragedy, any signs with any form of text on it, not just Japanese, would be completely removed. Which I'm guessing was probably done by like the production company who left it blank for localizers to fill it in later. But 4Kids was apparently just too lazy to change it back, even though some of it was already in English. <laughs> so it did- Everyone. One episode of the first season is pretty inspired by like Japanese folklore with them having to use these talismans to ward off a ghastly Which in the English dub they simplify as being anti-ghost stickers We have stickers These are anti-ghost stickers Now I know I'm giving four kids a lot of shit But honestly some of their dubs are really nostalgic for me Especially like Sonic X which I obviously grew up with Somebody wants Wait, I think I got the wrong movie. We begin with the classic Red Riding Hood scene, except that Red looks like a gnome. Not- the wolf already makes an appearance, complete with a super convincing grandma disguise. You've been dodging me all day, but now you might as well- Whoa, did he just grab- What the- What the fuck? What the fuck just happened? And no, sadly, the edits were in certain anime, they changed the blood to a much worse white that makes it look like aren't real, but what they are is very funny. Then she runs into Wolf, who actually seems pretty chill. Afternoon. I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> okay, never mind, bad call. And suddenly the wolf is a lot less creepy. <laughs> so you guys don't judge the book by its cover. <laughs> and he gets a taxi, which explains how he got to be in front of her. This is great. Of course, we all know what happens to him though. How long will you go for? A long time. Oh my god, this voice acting. It's the bill! You haven't paid in three months, you get back here and- Bing Bao's eat food. Huh. He say your food tastes like ass crap. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh man, this is too much. Oh. Oh. Also, Mario has a girlfriend. I don't know, she's not really important. Until the Koopalings freaking kidnap her, Jesus Christ. Okay, so, one thing I've always noticed about DreamWorks is that their movie trilogies are reasonably consistent in quality, in that for some reason, the second one is always an improvement over the first, usually by a pretty wide margin, but then the third one drops off pretty hard. Kung Fu Panda, right? The original was pretty good, the second one has no right to be as much of a banger as it is, and the third one is okay. Shrek, of course, goes from great to cinema and then to illumination level for the last two, because in an absolutely unprecedented move, the first is good, the second is better, but then the third one is still really good. (laughs) Not quite as good as the second one, let's not get carried away here, but it's nowhere near as much of a drop-off as usual. The first follows four zoo animals who manage to escape captivity to try and explore what the outside world is like, only to be captured and then shipped off to be somebody else's problem. Having only seen the sequels where they go all over the fucking place, I kind of appreciated that the only things that happen in this movie are like, there's a bunch of animals in the zoo, they break out, they get shipped off to Madagascar, and they meet King Julian. Like, I just wasn't expecting it to be as small scale as it was when I'm used to them fucking destroying half of Rio in a high-speed car chase. I think it just really goes to show how completely off the rails it gets by the third movie. Though that's not to say the first Madagascar movie doesn't immediately set the stage for the insane breakneck energy that this entire trilogy has. One thing I was not prepared for was how fucking annoying Alex is in this movie. It's like they gave Ben Stiller a ton of cocaine and then put him in a mocap suit and then animated it. There's like very few scenes where he's not doing 20 backflips or talking for 10 minutes straight. This is something they definitely turned 
toned down in the sequels, which is why those ones are better. But Alex probably still would have to be my least favorite part of the Madagascar movies. Night of the Museum will always be the superior Ben Stiller G. They do introduce in this one one of the greatest cinematic rivalries of all time between Alex the Lion and this random 87-year-old woman who assaults every single living being she comes into contact with. The penguins, which are the best thing ever put in any animated movie ever made, are used as sort of like a B-plot that they cut to every now and then, which they do across all three movies. But I don't think anyone would disagree with me if I said that I'm mainly watching it for the penguins. It is hilarious that they contrast them against the main plot where the characters like develop and go through conflict and all that, and then you just have these four complete lunatics just plowing their way through any situation with zero effort whatsoever. This one takes from the foundation laid by the original and adds like a surprising amount of like... The word I'm looking for is depth, but I don't want to say it because it's a fucking Madagascar movie. The Penguins have my favorite subplot of the entire trilogy here, where they spend nearly the entire runtime trying to rebuild the plane that got them there, which they do by abusing the monkey population, which all sets in motion a series of events that leads up to the film's climax. The plane won't be fixed until the suits meet our demands. Now, about maternity leave. Maternity leave? You're our male. In order to get parts for the plane, they hijack a bunch of cars from tourists. <laughs> And after a single day of them being stranded in a foreign country, they immediately create their own civilization, which causes them to build a dam, which takes away all of the water in the entire continent. So really, when you look at it, every other character in this movie, except the penguins, are entirely inconsequential because they are the only ones guiding the story along and everything happens as a direct result of their actions. And I mean, shit, it was the penguins that gave Marty the idea to leave the zoo in the first place in the original movie. Hey, hold up! Where is this place? Tell me where it is! You didn't see anything. In order to effectively raise the stakes this time, they introduce a villain who is on the same power level as the penguins, and it makes for some of the best scenes in the movie because neither of them ever seem to give a shit at any point about what's going on. If you were watching these when they came out in the cinemas, then this shit took them seven years. Something that I kind of love is that the Madagascar series does not spend a lot of time exploring the rules of its world. The best we really get is the ground rule that humans cannot understand the animals, but for some reason the animals can understand the humans. Why does every animal speak English, even in non-English speaking countries? Why do the animals know how to read human languages? Why does not a single person question that a bunch of escaped zoo animals not only know how to fly a plane, but also have clearly done so enough times that they know how to mount a rescue operation? Move over, Miss Daisy! What are you doing? Zebras can't drive! Only penguins and people can drive! None of this is ever acknowledged, and that is amazing. Did you guys know that piracy is a crime? And did you know that crimes are illegal? And did you also know that that anti-piracy ad actually increased piracy? I wonder why. It's almost like punishing the people who did legally pay for your product instead of the people who can just download it for free without the unskippable ad was a bad idea. Who would have thought?